This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're here, we're live, we're on Think Tech, we're on Think Tech Talks more specifically at the two o'clock block on a given Tuesday with Professor Sung Choi. He's the Associate Dean of the College of Engineering at UH Manoa. And he is also the director, you're a director of a program there. What is that, Sung? Director? <laughs> Assistant uh, director. You gotta be more specific than that, Jay. I mean, <laughs> we, we all got a lot of roles over here. <laughs> well, the important thing is your Associate Dean, yeah? Yeah, so one of the things that you're talking about is this uh, student research symposium. Mm -hmm. And it's actually led by College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources. But College of Engineering is a integral part of it. And every year we have undergraduate as well as graduate students uh, present via poster as well as oral presentations many of the research that's going on in the environmental sciences, agriculture, food sciences, and straight out engineering projects. You know, these, these programs, you, you're always there, Song. Every time I go to one of these community science programs for kids, you're there. Uh, well, I figured you're going to come, so I got to greet you. <laughs> you know, for example, I mean, every time I go to the science fair, you're there. Uh, you're a regular fixture at the science fair. I guess you're one of the celebrity judges, or maybe the chief judge. I, I was a chief judge. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you need new ideas and new personalities to come into the picture. So I did like my five, six year gig, and uh, I think it's time for somebody else to step in and maybe bring in some other ideas that I may have missed. Yeah. But, you know, you bring up a really good point. I guess I'm at a lot of these uh, science fairs, robot competitions, these uh, research competitions here at the university because it's one of the few ways I can encourage and give constructive criticism to uh, students to reach for that next step. You yeah. know, I mean, it, maybe they're that close and they just need a little bit more encouragement to take that one additional step. And, and if I was able to provide that, great. If some of the other judges were able to provide that, even better. But we need to make sure more and more people of our community gets involved so we can create our own uh, industry environment here, that high-tech environment that we're always trying to look for, as well as uh, create that workforce that we need to sustain ourselves. Mm -hmm. You remember that old saying, if we bring people in from the mainland, it's all about sand, surf, and sand outside. Mm -hmm. And that only lasts three years, right? And we need people to stay longer than three years. Well, how are we doing? You know, I mean, I remember you and I met, uh, gee, it must be the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, you, were, you were giving a talk about your uh, underwater autonomous vehicles mm -hmm. to a science group downtown, which I thought was really good that the university would come out and talk about that. And... And uh, those were the times when we were considering these questions up close. Uh, yeah. That is to establish a, a tech industry, uh, yeah. to see if we could do something with Act 221 and get some investment going. Um, and, you know, to bring the university elements together so that we had uh, graduates who were capable of, um, of, you know, entrepreneurial activity in science. How is it doing 20 years later? So let me talk in the straight numbers. Uh, back when we were in 2000, when, when I was one of the, actually, I was the first speaker for this thing called the Tech Showcase mm -hmm, of yeah, the University yeah. of Hawaii. Yep. Um, we were probably bordering around 100 graduates a year, maybe less, maybe 80 engineering graduates a year. Uh, where we're now at a point where our enrollment has pretty much tripled. And back yeah. then it was about 550 people in the College of Engineering. Mm -hmm. We now have about 1,500, 1500 students. Mm -hmm. uh, just last year, we graduated, I believe, 360 graduates that combined uh, undergraduate and graduate students. And for this year, so last semester and this upcoming semester, we're looking at 380 graduates. So if, if the numbers of the workforce as uh, being absorbed by our economy is an indication, 
we've done pretty well. Um, are they all in the uh, high tech sector? I don't believe so. I think uh, a lot of our engineering graduates, especially civil and mechanical engineers, are going to the construction industry, as you see all the cranes in Akako and various other parts mm -hmm. of the state. Mm -hmm. um, however, you know, bringing back this thing about the student research symposium, what's good is we're trying to give those students, many of those students, undergraduates, graduates, an opportunity to come out and showcase their idea. So whether their research or uh, project is really, uh, you know, state of the art, or if they happen to be a uh, confirmation of some of the fundamentals that have been learned in NPI, we're trying to do that. And the engineering uh, projects, along with the CTAR project, are a huge indication of this. So let me give you a couple of numbers for that. Yes. You know, engineering project wise, mm -hmm. we don't have as many in this CTAR slash college of engineering student research proposal. We probably have 20 posters and about five to eight uh, presentations, oral presentations. On the flip side, uh, uh, CTAR, College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources, we're probably looking at about 80 posters and about 30 to 40 presentations. So if anybody is interested, they should be putting April 6th and 7th on their calendar. Mm -hmm. April 6th afternoon, which is a Friday, mm -hmm. and April 7th uh, morning, which is a Saturday, they'll have the posters as well as uh, these oral presentations. And of course, the other thing is, if any of the industry, tech industry people want to be judges, they should really get in touch with us. Uh, I don't have the... Uh, email address, oh, off the top, uh, maybe I do. It looks, it looks like you can contact uh, HTTP at www.ttahr.hawaii.edu slash genius dash day. I'll try to send it to you later on as well, but uh, you know, if you were to go into Google and you did uh, UH Manoa CTAR mm -hmm. uh, uh, Student Research Symposium, they'll come right up. Mm -hmm. CTAHR, the College of yes. Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources. And you guys are in a, you're, you're co sponsoring this program, the U uh, and CTAR and the College of Engineering. Yeah. So, uh, what, what kind of projects? Can you give me some examples of the kind of projects that are going to be displayed in this program? So for uh, engineering, we've had things like studying the uh, water runoff that comes from the Manoa streams and to uh, figure out the chemical contents uh, to see how clean it is or how safe it is by the time it runs from top of Manoa Hill all the way to the bottom. And so we want to try to warn people. Uh, we also are very aware of like Manoa stream overflows. So we're trying to figure out uh, what type of systems will help that water irrigation down so we won't happen to have a flooded library again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, on the CTAR side, they're doing a lot of agricultural stuff where they're looking at different types of tropical diseases that have impacts on tropical fruits. Uh, they have a different type of food uh, um, uh, preserving systems. I mean, some people may have heard about it. There are uh, there's a group called the June Lab, and they're trying to figure out how to do fast freezing of foods, which is great for transportation of foods without changing color or losing color. So, for if you want a, if you want fresh ahi with that really good reddish color, you know you don't want to freeze it regularly because the water being frozen and thawing <laughs> takes that taste and color away. Uh, they have ways of fast freezing these things where when you thaw it out, it, it's just as good as the day you bought it. <laughs> so all those kind of things. Yeah. Interestingly, the other thing that I want to bring out is uh, remember fashion industry or you know the the, 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 the fashion aspects are also under CTAR, which is part of the human resources aspect. And they've been coming up with different type of fashion uh, shows and fashion uh, uh, intriguing points on uh, fabrics and stuff like that. And I know they were trying to incorporate and intertwine like 3D printing. 
because that was something that was big in New York City. Oh, it's years bigger ago, and bigger every time you look. They were trying yeah. to 3D print dresses. Yeah. So, you know, I'm sure in the near future, they're going to start 3D printing fabric. So why not get a 3D scanner, you know, scan me up, uh, send it to some uh, 3D printer, which could, which is basically a Star Trek replicator. And I'll end up with the suit right down the street at maybe King Bros or whatever. And I don't have to go in for this one week, two week uh, tailoring uh, suit makeup. So, you know, just a, as a, a footnote to that, I just saw a notice from the uh, Science Cafe, which is part of the Hawaii Academy of Science. Uh, and um, it's very interesting that they have somebody from, is it the College of, Eng College of Engineering? Somebody who is an expert in, in dyes uh, and using natural sources of color from mm -hmm. nature uh, to create color on fabrics. It sounds okay. like the same kind of subject. And they're giving a talk about that in the next few weeks at the Science uh, Cafe. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's so, great. Yeah. You know, that, that's, in a, in a sense, isn't that uh, obvious? Uh, if you go back in history, 2,000 years, all dyes are made natural products, uh, whether it's berries or the dirt or, you know, something that they find. So it, it, all, all this artificial stuff uh, doesn't really have to be, except for the fact that, uh, we're looking at the convenience and the cost factor, right? Yeah. So where where is, um, you know, the student uh, research symposium? Physically, where is it going to take place? Pardon me? I missed that. Where, where is the symposium, the student research symposium, going to take place? Oh, oh it, it, you know, benefiting us is, is incredible because, like I was mentioned before, mm -hmm. the various different type of ideas that come up, Mm -hmm. uh, is really an infusion of uh, a new ideas to our community and our industry. Where is so it, where's maybe, it going to be? Maybe this thing about the uh, fast freezing mm -hmm. would be something that is necessary for uh, our food industry, which is one of our main manufacturing industries in Hawaii, to have a bigger jump on trying to have a more impact on the rest of the world. Uh, Maybe, uh, so some of the other stuff that we've been doing in incorporation is the crossing between things like agriculture and engineering. Uh, more so would be things like use, use of drones, you and my you know, favorite topic, in trying to use uh, thermal or different types of cameras to see if they can pick up uh, tropical diseases on tropical plants and, uh, and fruits. From above, instead of having to go yeah. through each one separately, which would be extremely time consuming. Right? So this is a, this is these are science projects rather than entrepreneurial efforts. They're not new companies; they're scientific papers and projects um, that students have been working on. Am I right? But you know, uh, it, it, from research and the fact that you pick away at a rock enough times, it'll eventually break, or you hope that it breaks. Mm -hmm. Who knows, maybe somebody will come up with a brilliant way of doing something that will venture into a new company. And isn't that our hope all the time, that if it does, then sure. we can create that uh, fourth sector in our uh, economy that can sustain some of our, what, what people have been defining as a brain drain. Well, very important for Hawaii. We have to yes. have something other than a mono economy, and science is the ticket. So if, if somebody wants to submit a paper, or a project mm -hmm. uh, that would that submission the the presentation of that submission would take place on April sixth and seventh, right. and where would where would he be or she be presenting? Oh, what what will she be presenting? Where? Oh, where? <clears throat> it's usually in the uh, CTAR building. So there is a uh, agricultural agricultural science building, which is right across from the. Uh, the, the biomedical building, mm -hmm. which is the old medical science building on uh, UH Manoa campus. Mm -hmm. It's at the very end of uh, East West Road, and it's on the right side, and it'll take up the second, third floors on, on, on the walls, on the hallway walls. Yeah, I've seen it. I've been there. We, uh, we investigated some, uh, some toxic snails with uh, you John Paul. You, you know John Paul. Yeah, I remember John Paul. Yeah, and uh, uh, it's a quite a place. Sitar is quite a place. There's a huge laboratory in there. 
Uh, but let, let's take a break now, Song. Uh, this is Song Choi is, is, is the Associate Dean of the College of Engineering at UH Manoa. Uh, he's involved as, a, I guess, a, one of the, the partners organizing the Student Research Symposium uh, with the College, uh, College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources uh, on April 6th and 7th, and that would be at SITAR. Um, and if you, want to, uh, if you want to sign up and uh, present a paper, present your project there, just uh, look up the Student Research Symposium uh, on YouTube, at, uh, or rather on, uh, well, on Google, at, uh, at the College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources. In the meantime, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, Song, I'd like to address a whole new issue with you, uh, one we hadn't planned on discussing, uh, and that is uh, the, the nuclear warning took place on Saturday. We're entitling this part of the show, What Were You Going to Do in Your Last 38 Minutes? Uh, we'll take the short break. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up. And please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Hello everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Okay, we're back with Sung Choi. Hi, Sung. We Hi. see you better now. We're happy to do that. Uh, Sung Choi is the Associate Dean of the College of Engineering at UH Manoa. And I wanted to spend a little time with him in this show to talk about what happened on Saturday. And I guess, uh, I guess my primary interest, although I you know, discuss any aspect you like, uh, is um, exactly you know, what is the survival rate from a, a modern uh, you know, uh, nuclear bomb? And, you know, the, the realities in terms of dealing with that. I mean, I think people felt um, that if they took shelter on Saturday, they might have a chance to survive. Um, but, you know, a hard look at it, and you really wonder, you know, in a modern nuclear weapon of, say, 250 kilotons, um, you're not very likely to survive, are you? Uh, I kind of doubt that we'll survive. Yeah. So, so, so it's kind of interesting. This Saturday... Uh, I was actually involved in a uh, uh, VIX Robotics State Tournament. And I was the uh, head judge, and I had all my judges in a room at 7 a.m. And this thing goes off at like 8.04 or 8.05 a.m. And of course, I, I was calm as any cucumber you can find because <laughs> I've had bomb, you know, uh, put, uh, bomb threats on airplanes. And what can you do from up there? nothing right so i told them i said uh please you know just don't worry about it let's just continue with what we're doing here. <laughs> of course uh many of them asked me to confirm that it was not real so i had to call one of our former adjunct generals and had to bother him on a saturday to say can you find out for me <laughs> but obviously you know, you know there are signs all you have to do is uh when you get a phone phone message like that you can check your TV, you can check your radio, you can listen to the sirens. You could even listen to see if you hear planes going on. But as you were saying, the magnitude of the bombs these days, uh, assuming they're accurate enough to hit the target that you're looking for, I, I, I don't think survival rate is that high. Yeah. And I was joking with a friend of mine saying that maybe we should start building uh, underwater bunkers where we have some sort of safety <laughs> but but how can you you know how can you get anywhere in uh let's say from north korea 17 minutes did they say yeah yeah it's not a lot of time yeah well you know i mean and, and it affects different people in different ways i mean 
my own self with my wife. Uh, we retired to a part of our house that's uh, sort of against a hillside and uh, was, was going to be relatively safe, I suppose. Um, but the old notion of uh, duck and cover, as we used to play in school, mm -hmm. uh, they used to give us nuclear warnings in school when we were in grade school in the 50s, you know, thinking that uh, Russia was going to bomb us any day. Um, that, that's no longer appropriate, it seems like. If you're anywhere near, uh, you know, a two, that, and those days, you know, uh, uh, Hiroshima uh, size of bomb would be 15 kilotons, and now we got 250 kilotons, which is, yeah. well, gee, that's, you know, 15 times as much. And, and um, if you're anywhere near, you know, the explosion, you're, my, my thinking is you're toast. So there's no point in, you know, don't deceive yourself by thinking that you're going to survive. And, and, and Oahu, my guess, uh, I'd like your thoughts about this. My guess is that um, the, the blast would, would wipe out the city of Honolulu immediately. It, yeah. it travels at 750 uh, miles per second. That's pretty fast. Um, wiping out everything in its path. This is the blast, you know. And, and then if there are nuclear weapons, as there are in Pearl Harbor, I, I don't know if this happens uh, in the way of fission, but... If there are other nuclear weapons around, I'm wondering whether a bomb that was exploded in that area would tend to explode the other nuclear weapons. And so you could have a secondary blast as well if you have other bombs, you know, in the neighborhood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully the ones that are at the, uh, Pearl Harbor, since they are located on submarines and other aspects. I mean, you know, we do have a, uh, a clause in our Hawaii Constitution that bans nuclear anything on the islands, right? So maybe, but I, I would assume if, if the targets are Pearl Harbor and Pacific Command, which I would assume would be the logical places to hit, uh, a good portion of this island will get affected. Uh, you know, uh, a complete devastation where it wipes everything out, that's probably just as improbable as uh, not having as big of an effect. So yeah. if you're lucky, you will survive. I and mean, I think that's the same case in anything that we do. Uh, but probability-wise, uh, the chances are probably much lower. And like you said, it has grown at least 15 times in proportion. Yeah. And that, that's a pretty huge uh, devastation as to uh, the type of power we're looking at. And, and, and I, I guess almost the the responsibility that's entrusted upon us to be very careful with some of the developments that we make. Yeah, and I, you know, uh, I remember uh, when we were in college in the 60s and 70s, and there were all these peace movements. Uh, I guess it was an outgrowth of the, you know, resistance to the Vietnam War, to war in general. But mm -hmm. there were flower children, we we're all calling for the end of nuclear weapons ever. Um, right. And the funny thing is that we, we're not seeing that these days. Uh, we're not seeing the, the, the peace children, the flower children, uh, and we're not seeing protests against nuclear weapons in general. We're not seeing organizations that are dedicated to stopping nuclear weapons. Um, instead, we seem to be focused on what I consider an exercise, and that is letting you know you're about to be uh, uh, incinerated, uh, yeah. which, I, you know, which is a futile exercise, really. Uh, you know, and uh, times have changed, and we have rhetoric going around the world um, threatening nuclear war, but I don't think people understand what that really means, not only in the initial moments of it, um, but what it, what it means, um, you know, to, to any given society. For example, infrastructure, uh, water, electricity, food, I mean, all the things you need to live beyond an hour or two. Um, so I wonder if you have any thoughts on that from an engineering point of view. I mean, well, how would our infrastructure do? Uh, how would our city do in the case well, of a blast? Well, <laughs> you know, I, I'm in Holmes Hall, which is supposed to be one of the uh, natural disaster bunkers uh, in the city of Honolulu. And it is very well built. It is a monument to concrete and why we spend so much money on cement, okay? <laughs> However, if we're talking uh, a more of a devastating bomb, I don't know if these windows will hold. I don't know uh, if all this stuff will be as helpful. Maybe the, the force of some of those bombs will not, uh, or can, can be withheld by these uh, cement structures that we have. Uh, 
Uh, so there's probably going to have to be a rethinking. Uh, I believe with the um, development of engineering, uh, there's always uh, the counter aspects of the bombs that we make and all that. So I'm sure there are uh, steps that we can take to make ourselves safer. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, it isn't, isn't our main goal to somehow live peacefully. Yeah. Uh, these bombs are put into place because it was a power game between two major powers. Yeah. And maybe it's coming back. Maybe we're back to that Cold War syndrome where we have to do the same thing. Yeah. Well, I remember in the, in the time of duck and cover, they did have uh, air raid shelters. They had nuclear, you know, concrete air raid shelters underground. And there was a, a little sign. It was a, it was a yellow sign, and it had three black triangles on it. And mm -hmm. it, that was the sign of a, a nuclear uh, air raid shelter. And you would go down there, and there'd be water and food there and so forth. Somewhere along the line, Song, it fell into disuse. And I would say oh. in the country now, there are very few, if any, of those shelters that are still ready, you know, in a state of preparedness. Well, I mean, if you think about it, the goal was, the ultimate goal was to live in peace. So a lot of these things became just relics. Uh, if you look around our island, we still have bunkers from World War II and so forth. Uh, and what are they used for? They're used for like uh, uh, storage uh, units and all that. So, so I think transformation is good. I think change is good. But at the same time, uh, taking a step back, uh, one of the things we don't do uh, that I remember when I was a real little kid were, uh, like you said, these uh, uh, raid practices. You have these bomb raids, and then you have practices as to where to go, what to do, uh, how to roll if you're you know, catching on fire, all this stuff. I don't think 90% of the people now even know what those things are. Sure. Uh, my wife, uh, my wife uh, dutifully called the HPD when this uh, <laughs> thing, and uh, you know, nine one one, and uh, she got them. She got them on nine one one, and she said, uh, "The message says um, there's an incoming, you know, nuclear missile. Um, what do we do?" And the and the, the police officer on the other side said, uh, "Find shelter immediately." That was helpful because the message also said that. But there was no definition, and nobody knew. Nobody in this city or state knew where a shelter was, what a shelter means, mm -hmm. uh, how to find it, how to get there. I mean, theoretically, if you have an 18-minute uh, trip from North Korea to Honolulu, um, you, you don't have the average time is very little. And uh, since that message, you know, was, was sort of when it was approaching us. Uh, then you would have to say, well, you probably have seconds. How are you going to get anywhere? How are you going to do anything? How are you going to take any action in seconds? There's nothing you can do. One guy I talked to said, well, when I saw that, I, I decided I would go back to bed because there was nothing else I could do. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, it was very wise of him. <laughs> well, well, that's kind of interesting because, uh, you know, I think there was a newspaper article this morning with David Ige talking about those shoppers. But, you know, to make everybody else uh, that maybe you're listening to this feel a little bit more positive, we, we have one of the best military forces, and they have one of the best high, you know, state-of-the-art technology. And 17 minutes is a long time in the air, and I'm sure some of our uh, anti-aircraft you know, anti missiles, uh, our planes, will be able to go up and take a lot of these out before it gets in your meal. That means it's halfway up across the Pacific where there's nothing. So, you know, I, I think we should also be very hopeful and very thankful that we have a military service that can serve us. And as engineers, if people that have interest in engineers, as tinkerers, as entrepreneurs, uh, we really need to start figuring out how we can support our de uh, Department of Defense and our military. Yeah. And, and really, and, and we also have to become aware of the potential here aware of the solutions, uh, not only scientifically, but politically. And uh, we, should not, we should not actually vote for anybody who would like to push the button. Um, <laughs> that would be a beginning for me. Uh, you know, in the old days, uh, a politician got up and said, I, I want to push the button. He, he couldn't get any votes. Now, apparently, they can get votes, but they, they really shouldn't get votes. I want to I close with one other thought for you, Song. Sure. And that is this. 
Um, you know, recently there, there's been news about these swarms of uh, uh, drones, little ones, like three inches. Mm -hmm. And they, they go by artificial intelligence, they fly around, and they land on you, and they blow your brains out. And they know who you are. They can, they can tell with artificial intelligence who you are. And it strikes me that, you know, the wars of the future will not be by big bombs. The wars of the future will be, will be by much more sophisticated artificial intelligence uh, devices, sort of like those drones that fly around in, in swarms, uh, and you can't really protect very well against them. Do um, you have any thoughts about that? I mean, if you're going to focus on war, that would be an interesting kind of device to study. Well, I, I think you and I had a discussion about this on one of our cyber security talks, and that is wh why why drop bombs when you can send a bug, a cyber bug, and shut people down? If we shut the uh, finance system down, our communication system down, can you imagine the type of panic that people are going through? It may even be worse than this panic about ballistic or incoming ballistic missiles because people wouldn't know what to do. If I can't get, get money from the cash machine, how am I going to get my uh, ice cream cone or my hamburger, right? <laughs> and on top of that, this artificial intelligence stuff, who is to say that even the error that we saw here or the error that we saw in Japan were actually human? Maybe they had some artificial intelligence underlying input and Maybe it was a little game to see, like our hackathons, to see if somebody can go in and create a little hoax, let's say, okay? Yeah, no, I had the same thought, and it still remains a logical possibility that the fellow who, who thought he pushed the wrong button, in fact, didn't, and in fact, the machine had been hacked, and it looked like he pushed the wrong button, but the machine was pushing the wrong button, and that's a tremendous provocation, and maybe uh, a message to us all that these warning systems are not as reliable as we think because, yes, they can be hacked. <laughs> well, you know, anything that's digital that's hooked up to the Internet, <laughs> you are prone to being hacked. I <laughs> really All, You know, people used to say your phones cannot be hacked, a Macintosh computer cannot be hacked, mm -hmm. and we're finding out that one of the biggest bugs that resides in the computer or laptop right now are bugs that can hack Macintosh computers as well as the phones. Yeah. So... You carry all your information on your phone. You know, I think it's time to take a step back and say, do I need all this information on my phone? And all of this really depends on a public awareness of the principles of engineering. And that's why the College of Engineering is so important at UH Manoa, not only to you know, make a, a tech industry in the state, but also to raise awareness about engineering and about science so we all have a better understanding of the world, the new world in which we live. Thank you, Sung Choi. It's great to talk to you. Aloha. Aloha.